Today we're going to switch away from the sort of linear history that we've been covering the last couple of episodes and do something more along the lines of a survey of, of, the, of the writing instruments that man has used over history to take thoughts from here and put them out into the world. Because as I've mentioned before, it's this passing of knowledge, the, of thought, that has allowed civilization to become possible. That, and, and it's the writing of these thoughts and the celebration of this history that has allowed our civilization to evolve. Without writing, you know, maybe instead of going down to the farmer's market or the local stop and shop, we'd still be walking through the woods trying to find some berries. And as an editor, I would totally be out of a job. Welcome to the history of writing. The earliest tool used for writing, or at the very least proto-writing, is very likely the same tool that was used for pretty much everything else. I'm of course talking about our hands, particularly our fingers, which combined with a pigment of your choice, you know, which could really be anything, you know, it could be mashed fruit, could be guano, could even be blood if that's what you're into. You could write whatever and wherever you like. And lacking any of that, you, it, it's very easy to picture early man because as modern man, I know I've done this, so you've probably done this as well, just go with your fingers and trace into some substrate just trace your thoughts into it. You can write it with your finger, whether uh, into sand or mud or clay. Simple, right? Natural even, at least now. But such writing, while easy to do, was temporary. It, it could be washed away. It could be stepped on. It could be blown away by a strong gust of wind. It wasn't meant to last. It couldn't last. It was by design. It couldn't stay there. And what if the substrate, the surface that you were trying to write on was simply too hard to use your finger? Or maybe it was too painful for whatever reason. Maybe it was like the texture of sandpaper tearing away at your flesh. Well, thankfully, we started to use a tool for such occasions. Sharp objects. Yes, sharp objects. Whether it was a, a sharp rock a piece of metal, a jagged bone, whatever you want to call it. With these, we were able to engrave messages into harder, more durable surfaces. From simple stones to decorative turtle shells, sometimes even filling them with a pigment so they'd be easier to read. And these, these could last. They, they could last thousands of years, and some of them have lasted thousands of years, and that's the point. These are meant to be things that are going to be sticking around. I mean, there, there's a reason we cut proclamations into statues or winners' names into trophies. That's history in the making. Now, there's something of a variant of sharp objects that we still use to this day that has been in use for about 5,000 years, maybe longer. It was, dates back at least to the Sumerians and similar cultures around that time, and that is the stylus. For the Sumerians, it was one in the shape of a triangle, which created those wedge marks we talked about in an earlier episode, as well as, you know, simple straight lines, curves being a bit difficult. In ancient Rome, they used a long, thin stylus flat on one end to jot notes on wood tablets filled with wax. Flat part helped them rub the wax smooth, basically, you know, erasing the note. Something similar was used in Southeast Asia and India, where the most common writing surface was palm leaves. One end was pointed to inscribe the letters, and the other was flat to scrape a leaf surface smooth. In medieval times, they used a metal-tipped bone stylus, or a, a thin piece of lead called a plummet, to mark guidelines on vellum and parchment. For braille users, a stylus and slate combination allows for quick and easy notes. And millions of us today, of course, use dull-tipped rubber or plastic styluses, or styli if you prefer the Latin plural. I don't. 
We use these for any manner of electronic devices, from phones to, to tablets to laptops and to Nintendo Switches. So no, they're, they're not only for writing, but they're still writing instruments. And, you know, besides, I'm sure the Romans probably had some sort of alternate fun with their styluses back then as well. Yeah. Of course, the most common writing tool, and by all accounts, the most common writing tool throughout all of history, has been the pen. And while, yes, that includes the big ballpoint lying in your desk drawer without a cap on, drying out because you were lazy or just forgot, pens have come in all shapes and sizes over the years. The earliest consisted simply of, of a hollow tube with something of a point on one end, such as the reed pens used by ancient Egyptians to write on the rough paper-like papyrus. You'd need to dip them in ink over and over and over again but they worked extremely well while they lasted, which unfortunately wasn't actually all that long. They were also rather stiff, and so as other more delicate writing surfaces started to come into the fray, such as vellum and parchment, especially in medieval Europe, quill pens made from the feathers of large birds and far more durable became the tool of choice. These could come from all manners of birds and have over the years, from geese to ravens, to turkeys, and even swans and peacocks for those who like to be a little fancier. Quills became the standard tool of the trade and would remain so through the 1800s. They're even still used today for often symbolic reasons, and I happen to have one at the center of the Drunk on Writing logo. So yeah, you know, I'm kind of partial to them. But the problem with quills is that they tend to dull somewhat quickly and they take a while to prepare, so inevitably quills began to lose favor to metal-tipped pens. These weren't entirely new or novel and existed for years alongside quills as metal tips had been around nearly as long as metalworking, but in 1822 they started to be mass-produced, and that was a game-changer. Though they still had to work the same way as a quill, you know, you had to dip them over and over again. And they tended to corrode from the ink. There, there was acid uh, used in a lot of the early inks. Part of this problem, the dipping part, was solved with the introduction of fountain pens, which added a refillable ink reservoir. You might recognize fountain pens best, or at least I do, as the ones that tend to stain shirts or pants on TV and film, which also helped give rise to the pocket protector, of course. That would happen because the ink used in fountain pens tended to be a bit thinner than other inks, so that the uh, feed mechanism wouldn't get clogged by any uh, bad ink. Something of a variant of fountain pens is the cartridge pen, which introduced replaceable or disposable ink casings and helped give rise to what's probably in your pocket right now, or at least in your desk drawer or maybe on your desk somewhere or in you know a kitchen drawer. I don't know where you keep your pens. But, you know, the ballpoint, the felt tip, the roller ball, the gel pen, among others, they're all basically variations on this same kind of pen. And yes, while the cartridge tends to be replaceable in the majority of these, there are disposable ones. And honestly, I think most people just want to watch the world burn and they just throw them out anyway, no matter what, even if they are replaceable ink cartridges. Yeah. Uh... By the way, cartridge pens allow not just for various types of tips, but also for various types of ink, which help lead to the development of highlighters, markers, and the like. Another sort of variation on the pen, which is not really, it's not really a variation on the pen, but kind of is, is the brush, which, I mean, it's kind of like a really big pen, right? It's just like big pen. Um, though it does absolutely predate any kind of pen that has a brush-like tip. But with a brush, there's no rigidity. The, the end is soft, flexible, pliable. Whether they're made of split palm leaves as the Egyptians used, or bristle, which comes from hogs, pigs, and boars. And instead of pushing into the surface as you would with a pen, you sweep across it and create these beautiful pieces of art at the same time, as the Chinese have done seemingly forever, or at the very least, since the Han Dynasty. And yet, another variation on the pen, which again, yes, is absolutely 
not really a variation, but sort of kind of is, is the so-called inkless or endless pen, which is basically marking the ink speech for a pencil. Now, the idea of the pencil, this, this core of, of soft metal surrounded by a wrapping of sorts, isn't new. Ancient Romans used literal lead pencils to write on wood or papyrus. That, that plummet I mentioned earlier could also be considered an early prototype as well. But it was really the 1564 discovery of a large graphite deposit in England that gave rise to the modern pencil. At first, simply a graphite core wrapped in string or leather before becoming the mix of powdered graphite and clay housed in yellow painted wood we know and love today with the standard number two denoting the graphite clay mixture, HB, or hard black, and the yellow due to an 1800s effort to distinguish Chinese graphite from other graphite, a style everyone eventually just kind of took on. Good thing graphite was discovered, by the way. I don't know if you know this, but lead isn't the, the safest of materials to be working with. Kids, don't eat lead paint chips, okay? No lead. Stay away from it. There's also the wax pencil, which you, some people also call the grease pencil, which contains a colored wax core. They're usually for the sort of surfaces regular pens and pencils would have trouble with, like, like smooth porcelain or glass, and might also remind you of a similar writing instrument, crayons, though we tend to think of that more for artistic purposes than writing ones. But how about chalk? Also similar, though generally not wrapped in paper of any sort like crayons or wax pencils, and prominent in the 19th and 20th centuries in particular when paper was a bit less readily available due to a bunch of issues, uh, increased demand, a slow manufacturing process. So we had blackboards, both tablet and wall size, and a whole generation was introduced to the pleasure of after-school detention washing them, or clapping erases, or maybe just writing on them. There's one thing these last few examples all sort of have in common. They don't run out. You could use them until they fade away into nothing, until they, they're just a little memory. Though there is the mechanical pencil, coined as the ever-pointed pencil back in 1822, which is far more pen-like, and offers a more consistent point diameter as its core is an extremely thin piece of graphite fed to the tip through means of an internal mechanism. I never really liked those. They, they always tended to break on me. Maybe I just push a little too hard with my hands. I don't know. Um, but, you know, there, there are a few other writing instruments I, I feel like we have to touch on before we call it a day. Namely, typewriters and computers. Now, you could argue that these aren't writing instruments. After all, they're fundamentally different from every other thing that I've been talking about here. But I'd argue, first and foremost, that they are the writing instruments of our generation. After all, I wrote the script for this episode and pretty much every single other episode of Drunk on Writing on my computer. Not with a pencil, not with a pen, not with a quill, but with my computer. Although maybe the keyboard is the writing instrument. Regardless, the typewriter and computer can be traced back to Francesco Rampazzetto's Scrittura Tatile back in 1575, but it wasn't until 1870 that one became available commercially, and that thing looked weird. 1878 when the QWERTY keyboard became the standard, and 1910 when their design was somewhat standardized and shown to greatly improve the words per minute of stenographers. Electronic typewriters were available before long, and gave rise and way to word processors in the 60s, which in turn paved the way for personal computers, particularly from 1977 onward when the Commodore PET, the Apple II, and the TRS-80 Model 1 were released. And now, you know, we can write anywhere. Earlier today, I was writing on my laptop on the train. Last night, I took notes on my phone. You know, the point of this channel is to celebrate writing in all of its forms. And some people say that writing is endangered, reading is endangered, but it's not, you know, it's just changed forms. You know, we're not doing calligraphy generally as much as we used to, but we're typing constantly. Whether, yes, it might be shorthand LOL, but we are writing. Oh, you know what I forgot? Dictation machines, which can be traced back to Tom Edison's phonograph. Phonograph? Phonograph. But which 
didn't actually write for you. Transcription in this manner didn't really exist until about 1990, when Dragon Dictate first released, costing as much as a used car. Now there were some other programs out there at the time, but that one really was the flagship one, and Dragon Naturally Speaking followed and really helped push the tech through the 2000s. And now, my phone can do it for me. My laptop can do it for me. It's built right into Microsoft Word. A smart speaker can do it too if you're, you know, one of those people. Alexa. Hey Siri. Okay, Google. Sweet, sweet silence. Just the way I like it. I think that's all for today. I think we're going to close out this episode of Drunk on Riding's History of Riding with that last little fun No, I, I hope you learned something. Um, but since this was only a survey, I, I really suggest you go into the description below and do some further reading, do some further research on any of the riding instruments that may have caught your eye. I think quills are pretty cool. I didn't talk about every single variation of them. There's a lot with metal tips. There's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of variations of pens. Like it's just astounding how many different versions of pens are on. Everybody has a different patent. It's, it's just kind of bonkers. But uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. Please leave a comment below and let me know that you did. Um, head on over to drunkonwriting.com and help support the channel. Help create more videos like this. You know, there are a lot of exclusives over there. I hope you check it out. And, uh, you know, until next time, cheers and keep on writing.